Acts chapter 15. I'm going to read and go through the entire chapter. The first part of the chapter is a little uncomfortable to talk about. Because there were certain things that were happening in the church because they lived under the law. How many of you understand we don't live under the law, we live under grace, right? We couldn't handle living under the law. 2,300 different rules that you had to follow. If you go and read Leviticus and, 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 and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all these things, there's, you might as well just throw in the towel and lay down and start making a snow angel until you dig your own grave because none of us could live up to what the law was. And remember what's happening. Let me just give it to you in the New Testament. The power of Pentecost happened the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. People filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other languages, speaking in other tongues. There's different instances of different things happening. Miracles, signs, wonders. People, people literally raised from, that couldn't walk. I mean, all these great and wonderful things are happening. Peter has a vision. He goes to the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile which we are all Gentiles this morning. He goes to Cornelius, and when he goes to Cornelius, the gospel is shared with anybody that's not a Jew. And, and, and everything, and I'm going to be honest with you, when we get close to Lent, we read through the, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want you to pay close attention the next time we go through Lent. Even Jesus made it clear he was here for the Jews. Some people say to me, Pastor, what about this rapture stuff and, well, the tribulation and all this stuff? Uh, and, and, and I know, and you may not agree with me, and we'll talk about that even in this chapter if you don't agree with me. But the whole meaning of the rapture taking place and everything happened is not for the Gentile. It's for the Jew. And Gentiles will be okay, and there'll be good things that'll happen. It's because God is preparing his people, and he wants his people to accept the Messiah, and there's things that have to happen. But at this part, now it's open to everybody. But some of the people were old school. And some of the people were caught up in some things that they thought everyone should still have to do, even if they were a Gentile. So don't stand. You know, I'm not going to ask you to stand. But we're going to start here in chapter 15, in verse number 1. And a certain, a certain, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. And these are people teaching in the church. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. The, so they sent on their way by the church. They passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing the conversation of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to come to all brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that the Lord had done to them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who, who believed rose up saying, is it necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses? Now, you may think this is strange, but as a pastor, I've literally had adult people come to me after they've been saved and ask if they should be circumcised. You say, is he talking about what I think he's talking about? Yes. If you don't know what circumcision is, ask Brother Cook after the service. And he, raise your hand, Brother Cook. He's the one saying, I've been redeemed. He's going to tell you how you be circumcised too. See Brother Cook and he can explain it to you. Now, what did it have to do with your salvation? Absolutely nothing. Well, I mean, it, didn't, it didn't matter to you. You guys were all right. These guys were messed up. And the apostles and elders came together to consider this manner because revival broke loose. And here's all the, hey, wait a minute. You haven't been circumcised. You can't be saved unless you've been circumcised. And look at verse number seven. And when there was much dispute, folks, this was reasoned. This was argued 
among God's people. Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, do you not know a good while ago God chose among us that out of my mouth the Gentiles could hear the word of the gospel and believe? So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us and made no distinction between us and then purifying their hearts of faith. Now, therefore, why do we test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor anybody would be able to bear? But we believe that through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in that same manner. And the crowd became silent because you got to understand Right now, 5,000 added to the church daily. 3,000 added to the church daily. But when you went to some churches, it was like us. You know, hey, let's bow our head and, and close our eyes. If, if you feel like you're ready to receive salvation, why don't you just raise your hand? You know how we do it, right? Why don't you come to the altar and, and, and we will lead you to the Lord and, and we, will, we will, you know what I'm doing, don't you? We, we will pray for you and everything's going to be all right. I and mean, you know what? It's hard to get people to do it now, Cars. But if there was that other group of the crazy Pentecostal movement of, of the day of Pentecost. And they would be like this, you know, bow your head and men, drop your drawers. You know, we, we have anointing oil up here. Imagine this invitation. Come on, brother. Come on, brother. You know you need to get saved. Hey, you, hey, you need the Lord. Yeah, yeah, you need the Lord. Right? Man, you, you, you think it's hard to have revival. Right? There's, Peter, there's Paul and Barnabas, man. They're laying hands on people. Y'all getting nervous, I know. You should be. <laughs> you know, here's Paul and Barnabas, man. And God's moving, people getting saved. Everything's happening. They're like, oh, by the way, uh, they're at the church over there in Antioch. Uh, we have three quarts of blood that's all over the sanctuary. Folks, they were circumcising the men when they became saved. Okay, it's not going to be on the screen. <laughs> De definitely, that's not going to be on the screen. But in chapter 16, of verse number 1 and 2 of chapter 16, who has their Bible right there? New King James. I don't think, I don't think you have it. Brother Cook, would you read six, chapter 16, verse 1 and 2? Next verse. He did what? Spell it. No, I'm joking. You don't have to spell it. But that's enough. I mean, you get the point, right? We'll hit that. We'll hit that Wednesday night, actually. Great things happened in chapter 16. This old boy in the very next chapter here, even after this dispute, comes and is led to the Lord. And they think this guy's special. He's got a calling on his life. They circumcised him right there as an adult man in the middle of the road. You see, I heard some of y'all Bible scholars be like, you know, it's really just circumcision of your heart. That's what God wants to do. Listen, and maybe that's what he wants to do under grace. How many of you just wished I'd put this knife down? Please. All right. I can see your face. Please. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to Leanna. Come on, honey. Let me give this to you. Yeah, I know. I might regret that later. Somehow she found out and she was patting me down as I was coming up and she said, where's the knife? I don't know how that happened. Much dispute. Much dispute. You say, why are you talking about this? Because this is just as important as anything else that happens in the book of Acts. And I'll explain to you why. They became quiet. The multitude kept silent in verse number 12 and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had done. And after they became silent, James, here's James. You know James, the one that Leanna did the Bible study about? The brother of Jesus? He's mentioned in Acts. That might be a good trivia question someday, right? James speaks up and he says here, 
Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at his first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And when this word, the prophets agreed with him, he begins to quote what David said years ago. And he says in verse number 20, let me just go down for time's sake. And that we write to them to abstain from the pollution, polluted things of idols, from sexual immorality, and from things strangled, and for things of blood. And Moses, verse number 21, has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders for the whole church to see chosen men of their own company in Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also with Barnabas and Silas, leading men among their brethren. So they decided they wrote a letter to everyone, okay? Because the news of Jesus is coming, so every evangelist now had a letter in his hand. And when he went to the city... It was either a knife or a letter in his hand, right? So guess what? The move of God began to stop because of tradition and because of things that really didn't matter. And here's the letter that he wrote. You can read it here. He wrote to them in verse number 23, the apostles and elders and brethren to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Sicily, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we give no such commandment. All you men ought to be saying, praise the Lord. Right? It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you from our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their life for the name of Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas who will also report the same things by word and mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That ye abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. And to keep yourself from these things, ye will do well. Farewell. And here's what I want you to understand about this. The important thing to understand more than anything else is everyone in this room was raised a little different. And everyone in this room may have been taught a little different about certain things. And I understand, I love, I love, I love great traditions that we have. You know, we, we have traditions in our family and I have things, but we have to make sure that the traditions that we have don't keep people from coming to Jesus. Amen. And I, I, I listen, I, 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 and I'm, I'm not saying this to offend you and you'll forgive me here in a minute when we're getting ready to go into, but we spent years more concerned about the length of a woman's hair and the length of her dress than the condition of her heart. And there were years of my life that I preached on things. I, I was confessing this to mom a couple, maybe two weeks ago. I was talking about it. I said, mom, when I was a young minister, I would have never listened to Ronnie Smith. I would have never said under Ronnie Smith because I was too much of a Pharisee and a Sadducee. And I would have judged him for things that he'd been through in his life. And we've got too much judging going on. And we've got too many people with knives and scissors just saying, listen, if you don't look a certain way and you don't act a certain way, then you don't know, well, you can't be what God wants you to be. But he said, come ye all that are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's not about your hair. And listen, we got to be modest. Modest, 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 modest. We got to cover our bodies up and we need to have morals and we need to have character and we need to take dignity that our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost and we shouldn't abuse it. But on the other hand, how many times do we turn into the Acts chapter 15 church? And how many people are not here today, not because they don't need God, but they're worried that you would have your scissors and your knives with you and cut them apart when they come in here. How many times do you witness to your family and they say, I don't have a dress to wear. I don't have any nice clothes to wear. 
Jensen Franklin said, I think I said it last week, I said it, somebody said it on social media this week, you don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. You can't wait and clean yourself up and then try to come in and think everything's going to be all right because the devil will always make an excuse to keep you out there. You've got to come in. And this little letter that they wrote changed the attitude of the New Testament from law to grace. And it's just as important as the day of Pentecost. It's just as important as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's just as important as the fire to understand that you can't have condemnation and think that you're going to be able to lead anybody. Because, hey, if we, if we wanted somebody perfect standing in front of us today, who wants the mic? Who wants the mic, right? Because, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And man, we'll just continue here real quick. And when they had sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered, a let, they delivered the letter that I read to you. When they had read it, they rejoiced. Can you imagine? All those guys were like, whoa, praise God. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. <laughs> Woo. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after that they had stayed there for a time, they sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. Howbeit, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So basically what it says there, they lived happily ever after. Right? Okay. Throw your knives down. Throw your scissors away. Now I want to preach to you this morning. I gave you that because I told God we'd go through the whole chapters. And I think that it's important to go through what we went through. But something happened immediately right here in Acts chapter 15 that could have destroyed the move of God. It could have destroyed and annihilated everything that God had. In verse number 36, then some days... Then after some days, Paul and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, excuse me, let us now go and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined that he would take John Mark. John Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take him with them, the one who departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention between, the, the, then the contention became so sharp that they parted one from another. And so Barnabas took John Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being commanded by the brethren to give the grace of God and went on to Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Now, this kind of sounds a little bit simple, but if you want to look in your history, you want to Google it, you want to look at anything you want to do, this was a heated exchange between two of the most important people of the New Testament that we look at here in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 15. Paul and Barnabas. It was Barnabas who took Paul under his wing when he was still Saul. When he was a Christian killer who had been converted and he loved him and he taught him in the ways of the Lord. And Paul spent two years with him being raised up by him. And now they have a disagreement. They have a disagreement about a man by the name of John Mark who was a cousin to Barnabas. So Barnabas was taken up for his cousin. Paul said, no, I don't want John Mark to go with us. John Mark was on a journey with us and we turned around and he left us for dead on the side of the road. We don't know where he went, but he quit doing what we was doing. Maybe it's when people were getting killed. Maybe as we talked about Wednesday night, when Peter was in the middle of the road beaten to a pulp and his blood was there. The brothers were gathered around. Guess what? John Mark wasn't there. Paul remembered these things. Who was right? Who was wrong? Who was discerning and who was envious and who was holding grudges? Man, how many of you, you didn't even realize this was in the Bible, right? Man, we got, you, you talk about these soap operas and stuff that you, you, you know, all green, green anatomy or whatever it's called, green, whatever, gray, gray, gray house for lives or whatever that it is. 
Do you think you had juicy stuff happening in, in the gray housewives, man? This stuff right here is juicier than that. It's crazy. Paul was upset. He said, no. What do we learn from this disagreement? What's the title of this series? The way a Christian should acts. We throw that S in there because of the acts of the apostles. I want to point out some things to you about how these men handled themselves in the midst of conflict and how that we, as men and women of God, not when we have a dispute with the world, but what do we do when we have a dispute with our brother or our superior in Christ or our former pastor or someone that we had confidence in? What do we do? What can we take for this? Number one, just because you get mad doesn't mean you quit. Somebody ought to amen me with that. I hope they got that on the screen for you to see. Just because you get mad doesn't mean that you quit. Go back and look here at what happened to them when the contention was so sharp in verse number 15, chapter 15, verse number 39. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted the ways. What happened? Paul chose Silas and he went on. And Barnabas took John Mark and he sailed to Cyprus and they went on doing God's business. How many people are out of the ministry today? Not because of the devil. But because they chose contention, they got mad at somebody in the church, somebody hurt their feelings, somebody sat in their pew, man, I wish somebody helped me preach this morning. And instead of working their way through it, instead of doing what needed to be done, they said, you know what, I'm not going to church anymore as long as they're there. Well, honey, what are you gonna do about going to heaven? Because if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. And there's going to be people in heaven that you didn't think should be there. And honey, there'll be people that you think's going to be there that won't be there if they aren't the way a Christian should act. Well, I'm telling you here, the work of God, number, number two, the second thing, the work of God continues no matter who leaves you. No matter who you think you can count on, anybody that's been in ministry, any length of time, understand that the very one that tells you they love you and are there for you no matter what will be the first, where's that knife? Will be the first one to stab you in the back and leave you on the side of the road for dead and could care if anybody does anything in your life. The meanest people I've ever met in my life are not worldly people, but church people that didn't know how a Christian should act. So number one, just because you get mad doesn't mean you quit. Number two, the work of God continues no matter who leaves us. Number three, it doesn't matter who was right and who was wrong. You see, here's what you have to understand. You think in your mind, listen to me, that you have to pick sides in every conflict. You read it on social media, what do you do? You make a decision on whether you think you believe it or not. Man, y'all can look real sanctified if you want to and act like you don't deal with this, but honey, you know that it's true. We think that we have to take sides. Let's say me and G, come here, help me, man. Me and G love G, I'm a right hand man, one, one of many, but you know what? We may not always see eye to eye. At the end of the day, I'm his pastor. Right? And let's just be real. There's times that G has came to me and said, Pastor, I come to you humbly, but there's something I think I need to tell you. One of them is this time last year when I thought I was done. And we took a few weeks off. And he stood right back there by where Richard and Vanna was, and he began to said, the Lord laid Moses on my heart about how when Moses was in the battle, as long as they held his arms up, Israel had victory. But the thing was, he was there. And he said, Pastor, you can't go away because if you go away, you won't come back. Let us hold your arms up and get back in there. And blessed be God, you did. To God be the glory. Hey, I'm old enough to be his father. But he was right. There's been times I've had to have talks with him and say, gee, this, that, or another. 
you won't receive discipline and love from your pastor, you're not going to take it from anybody. But if G and I have a disagreement, you don't have to decide who's right and who's wrong. You do what's right, and you do what God's called you to do. You say, why are you preaching this? Because that's Acts 15. We're going through the whole thing. We're not skipping it. G, we'll figure it out. And your pastor will figure it out. Because... Number one, just because you get mad doesn't mean you quit. Number two, the work of God continues no matter what, who leaves you. Number three, it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. And number four, you can't give up on people. Amen. Amen. Paul, at this point, had given up on John Mark. He didn't want to be around him. Barnabas says, dude, that's my cousin. I still believe in him. Number five, this is the key thing to remember that I wanted to point out to you about that illustration, is when you do what is right, it will always lead to reconciliation and restoration. Amen. When you do what's right, when you don't gossip and build your little army against them to try to get people in your corner so that you can walk in the room and uh, remember that bad video when they were there with their knives and they're walking... Y'all don't even know what bad was. Pete and Jill, I know you know who Michael Jackson was. They were there with their knife and they had their people behind them. I'm bad. I'm bad. And here was the other group on the other side. They had their people with their switchblades. Y'all, y'all remember that video? Yeah. <laughs> was that good? That was pretty good. Wasn't it? Right? Right? Well, what do we want to do? We want to build our own little kingdom. I got to get these people against G because I've got to have an army behind me. You know what? Just do what's right and God will work it out. Glory. We're not always going to agree. We're not always going to see eye to eye. But don't think that your opinion is better than anybody else's. Because I learned a long time ago, if you will humble yourself and pray and stay under the cross at the feet of Jesus, he'll reveal things to you and there'll be times when you were wrong. Amen. But you never get to apologize when you build your little army and you just go on to the church down the road. It's too late. Is this good or what? Amen. And God laid it on my heart. I weeped and I cried and I thought about times in my life. was right everything would have been okay but I got scared so what happens to John Mark is he reconciled let me tell you a little bit what happened Paul finds himself at the end of his life right before the scripture and I'm closing I won't hold you too much longer Right before the scripture, you know where he said, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my course. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's writing as he comes to the end of his life. He knows his time is coming. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 9, this is what Paul writes. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas, or Demas, or Damas, whatever you want to call him. <laughs> Some of y'all are slow this morning. For, for Demas... For Demos. Hey, I'm not done. Get, pull yourself back in. For Demos has forsaken me. This is Paul talking. Having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Christians of Galatia, Titus, and Dolomita. He loved this world more than he loved God. In verse number 11, only a 
Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me in ministry. It's Isolus and I have sent him to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I have left with Carpus and Trias when you come and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did much harm me. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Paul ran across other people that didn't do things the right way, and he pointed it out to Timothy here. But in that verse of rebuke, he mentions John Mark. And he said, bring him to me, because he'll do us some good. Colossa was a church. The, the Colossians, the book of Colossians, Colossae was the city. And listen to what Paul said in verse number 10 of chapter 4 of Colossians. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Did we ever think that we could see restoration in the book of Acts? When Paul on his last journey, before he loses his life, one of the last people that he mentions is the one that he literally separated from his brother from. And if you can remember those five things that I gave you, there's a call of God on your life. And even if you are parting your ways with people in your life that you used to do ministry with, or you used to be with, and just like my message last Sunday, when you have to shake the dust off your shoes and go on, you do it the way a Christian should act. You love them and you bless them and you don't talk about them anymore and you move on. Amen. By the way, and I'm closing. By the way, John Mark, whatever happened to John Mark? Well, let me tell you what happened to John Mark. Listen to me. Don't lose me now. John Mark goes on after this. And he writes one of the four gospels. Amen. Matthew. Mark. That Mark. That Mark was the same Mark who caused dissension with Paul and Barnabas. Don't give up on me yet. Don't give up on somebody left that you've, don't give up on them that you thought they weren't gonna be nothing. You gotta forgive in your heart and you gotta pray for them and you gotta bless them because, okay, Mark, let me tell you this. The Lord's Supper where it took place in that little, I'm not even gonna tell you the name because it's hard to pronounce. The place that it took place was in John Mark's mother's house. That's where the last supper took place. And the place John Mark was raised in. When, I hate to tell you this too, it's not 100% clear, but there's a, John, John Mark must have been a weird dude. I'm gonna tell you, he's kind of weird because if you remember in one of the gospels when he was in Gethsemane and they came to arrest him, there's just one little mention of some dude come running out of there naked. Guess who that was? That was John Mark. Here's Jesus getting arrested. He just strips off naked and takes off running in the garden. I don't know. 
It's not in all four Gospels. I can't remember which one it's in. But I remember reading that during Lent with the kids, and they're like, what's up with this dude? Just pray for him. Where's the knife? Where's the scissors? Come on, let's go. But also, it's a little weird, but you know what? So are you. So it's okay. Jesus, in the Last Supper, according to history, according to history, Josephus and some of the other books, <laughs> the Last Supper, Jesus took his outer garment off, right? And what did he do? He washed the feet of the disciples. He looks to one and the other writings to go get him the water. Guess who the one is that brings the water to Jesus, that goes in the basin, that he literally washes the feet, not only people that he loved, but his betrayer, Judas. It was John Mark. John Mark, when the battle got hard, Paul turns around and he's disappeared. But somewhere he figured it out because Barnabas didn't give, on, give up on him. And what I want to be to you today is your Barnabas because I'm not giving up on you. In AD 68, they placed a rope around his neck and they drug him head first through the city over every bump and every crevice and every corral until they shredded his body. That was John Mark. I'd like to think of what would have happened to the church if Paul and Barnabas would have just ran like some of us do when things don't go our way. But they didn't give up. God's work goes on regardless. They didn't take sides. They did what was right. And we have the book of Mark today. When you read the book of Mark, now it's going to be different. You're going to, man, you're going to picture that little naked guy running across the garden, right? But seriously, on a serious note, when you read Mark, Mark could very easily be you. In your story of restoration in your life, there's times you've tucked your head and you ran. Or times you made mistakes or showed yourself. God forgave him and he'll forgive you. Will you please stand with me all over the building today? I'm ask, gonna ask you to do something. Please, nobody moving around unless you're coming to the altar. Would you just close your eyes, please, just for a moment? And here's, here's what I would like for you to do. Would you please do this? Would you just think about everything that's been preached to you today? And ask the Holy Spirit how he can speak to your heart right now about what's happened. Would you think about that just for a moment? Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you with all humility in my heart. And I thank you, dear God, for every single person that is here under the sound of my voice. Lord, no doubt we have some John Marks among us who have the call, but have made mistakes. Lord, we have some Pauls among us. And maybe we're a little too tough in a few situations. God, I pray we'll have a house full of Barnabases this morning. Lord, just as you didn't give up on us, they won't give up on them. And Lord, I pray as we come to this time of invitation that this altar will be filled with people that need reconciliation. They need restoration in their life. They need to restore their relationship with you, God. 
There's some people needs to be saved. There's some people needs to confess some sin in their life. You need to come before the Lord. There's some people that need healing because of the Pauls that have hurt you in your life. Today is your day of restoration. Some of you just need to make a commitment today to be like John Mark that says, you know what? I've messed up in the past, but from this day forward, I'm going to move on and I'm going to do and be what God has called me to be. And you need to make that commitment to the Lord today. Lord, I pray that conviction would be upon the heart of the believer and the sinner. And those that are called upon you today, let your Holy Spirit begin to flow in this service. God, would you just soften somebody's heart right now, Lord, to give them the strength to step out of their seat and come down this altar. Come down this altar right now and find peace in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you come? These altars are open. Come on, step out of your seat this morning. Why don't you just ask that person next to you? Would you ask them, would you please do that this morning? Would you say, hey, would you like to go pray? Go ahead, ask them. Say, hey, if they say yes, come on with them. Come with them right now. Take them by the hand. Come with them. That's it. Come with them right now. Let's spend some time in the altar this morning. Hallelujah. Saints begin to pray. God's moving in this service right now. Hallelujah. That's it. There's others. Where are you? Yeah. 